Well, I have the top of the hour, so let's begin. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here today. We have a great guest on an important topic, and we have so much to talk about. Donna White is an extraordinary person. Uh, she's the director of a great outfit in the Washington, D.C. area, a collaboration between that nonprofit and a few different uh, universities. Breakthrough Tech D.C. aims to help women and underrepresented minorities get more access to technology, training, and practice. Uh, these are all populations that tend to be underrepresented in technology, specifically digital technology. And all this group does is focus on reversing that underrepresentation. Uh, it's a great project, and we'd love to hear more about it, especially what it tells us about higher education. So without any further ado, let me just welcome Director Donna White. Hello. Good afternoon, Brian. Whoa, you got a little scratchy on your on your audio there. Can you speak again? Good afternoon. Yeah, um, there's a little uh, kind of buzz um, on on the words. I don't know if you can hear it. Um, can can you uh, quickly turn your mic off and on again? Sure. Sorry about that. It's uh, okay. It's off. And so speak again. Hello. Ah, uh, it's still kind of funny. Still thing? Okay. Yeah, Let me hear. take my. Try it again. Does that work better? Whoa, it really does. Okay. Oh, man, that just completely wiped the sound. Oh, that was, whatever was causing that buzz, it was in your ears, and you got rid of it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome, um, Director White. I'm so glad to see you, um, and your work is so important. L let me just ask, to introduce you to people, uh, we have a custom here. We ask people to introduce themselves by talking about what they're doing for the next year. So I'm curious, what are you going to be working on uh, at Breakthrough or elsewhere? What are the big topics and the big projects that are really uppermost in your mind? Wonderful. Um, so thank you again for having me. And thank you to all the, um, those who are listening in and watching. Um, and please call me Donna. Um, Breakthrough Tech uh, is an organization that started in New York. And um, we expanded into D.C. in 2021. And so one of the things that I'm always looking to um, increase, um, especially as we're looking at um, statistics. Um, so, for example, the Bureau of Labor Statistics projects that employment in computer and information technology occupations is projected to grow by 13 percent between 2020 and 2030. So one of the things that I am um, credited for doing or um, it is important for me to do is to work with the two partner universities um, in DC, University of Maryland, College Park, as well as George Mason University uh, to continue to focus on interventions um, for a critically important population and that's diverse group of uh, college women. Um, as well, I'm working to with pretty esteemed colleagues across those two universities uh, to really break down barriers that keep diverse women from studying and working in tech. And as well, um, it's important to be able to work across sectors. So I'm just one person, but um, because of the fabulous teams that I work with in um, computer science and information sciences at the two universities, um, we work along with industry um, to ensure that we have opportunities and that we're supporting um, students who are embarking on computer science and information sciences majors. So really I am working to ensure that we are creating these supports and make it, making sure that the sectors um, are preparing those students for um, a future post-graduation. Uh, Wow, that's a tremendous amount of, of work. Um, I, I, I have to ask, what, what are some of those supports look like? That's what you see some providing support. Like. Is that financial? Is that mental health? Is that networking opportunities? How does that work? So one of the things that um, with Breakthrough Tech, um, we focus on three key areas. Um, we call our call them our three C's. So curriculum, that means that we are looking at ways to really be able to expand access um, in introductory computer science classes um, so that we are increasing the number of majors uh, in that field. 
Um, we're also looking at career preparation and experiential learning. So we want to ensure that we're providing opportunities for students, especially early in their career, their college career, uh, to be able to gain the credentials that are um, necessary for them to have additional opportunities like summer internships, and then we hope um, then full-time hire. And then the third C would be around community building. So we're really looking at how do we grow community? We understand that whatever field you're in, whatever work you're doing, that um, a, a sense of community is important and especially with perseverance. And so we wanna make sure that we have that community, whether it's within that institution or across all breakthrough tech sites um, we want to make sure that they understand who is there to support them um, both on the student side as well as with industry professionals i see so we have to have curriculum credentials and also community Correct. Uh, that's a that's a whole range of support uh, friends just just to let you know I, i've got a couple of quick questions to ask but the forum is here for you this is your place to ask questions um, and we are really grateful to hear uh, any questions you have or comments or suggestions or further questions. Um, this is your place. So please just go to the bottom of your screen and click the raised hand if you want to be up here. Uh, I promise people without a lot of hair are as welcome as uh, Donna and I. Um, and or just type in the Q&A box and we'd love to hear your thoughts. In fact, in me, even before I can finish saying that, Donna, uh, Donnie Sendelbach, um, in the in the chat said this is such an important topic. Those of us here need to share out this session to others. Glad to hear it, Donnie. Please just you know take the link and fling it uh, on LinkedIn, and Facebook, uh, and Twitter, and elsewhere. Uh, we you know the more people, the more conversation, the better. Um, one question I have uh, is: Are you working primarily with college students who are undergrads, or are you also working in primary and secondary schools? Or are you working with just people who aren't enrolled but are interested in technology? I mean, who's your primary constituency? Um, our primary constituency is uh, our undergrads. So we recognize the importance of all programming. Um, for me, I'm not a um, traditional, I'm not an academic. So I come from um, a program background, nonprofits um, specifically. Mm. And because of that, I understand um, what is needed for those programs and those supports to be able to support students through the K-12 process. Um, with Breakthrough Tech, we are primary, we are focused on undergraduates uh, because we recognize that that is the, really the first point for them to be able to gain um, one because they are now declaring a major and that's where their academic focus will be for that time but as well being able to provide them with those real life experiences like an internship um and that can't it usually doesn't happen until they get to college we do recognize that there are opportunities um, earlier um, for some students, but we also recognize that once they get to college, those are where a lot of those opportunities are created. One thing that I did want to point out about um, Breakthrough Tech is that we specifically focus on large public universities. And we specifically focus in on that target audience because we recognize that in some instances, it is a barrier for um, recruitment from some companies. Um, they may tend to go to the same universities, typically private universities with a very high reputation of being able to, to um, have graduates that then are fed into um, the career tech pipeline. And so some of those opportunities may not always be extended to public universities. And so we want to make sure that we are focusing uh, in an area where we are creating this additional opportunity for students who may not have it. Oh, that's a great point. I, I can see your uh, nonprofit background uh, at work and that kind of strategy. That's excellent. <laughs> uh, and welcome to people who just crashed in the door. Uh, glad to see you, folks like Philip and Lee. Hello, Christina, Charles, and Julia. Speaking of Charles, he has a question, a good clarifying question. Um, whoops, hang on one second, let me bring this up. If I press the right button, I can remember how to type. Who are the underrepresented? Gender identity, age, family background, or what? 
all of them are represent underrepresented. Uh, so we say um, women, um, non-binary, first generation students, um, right. students who may identify from a non-traditional ethnic and racial category that are in tech careers. So I do want to make sure that we are delineating. Um, it's those who, those students who may not traditionally um, have a job in a tech. So those who are represented in tech careers, um, but it's anyone um, because we are working in um, institutions. We know that anyone uh, may have barriers to their work. So while our focus is on women, um, we don't discourage anyone um, that may identify from a, a, a gender that may not be women or non-binary. Um, and if they are first generation, we wanna make sure that all students have access to our programming. Very good. Um, thank you for the question, Charles. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, thank you for that clear answer, Donna. And if you're if you're new to the forum, that's an example of a Q&A box. So uh, just type in a question like Charles's and you can see I'll flash it on the screen for everybody. And now that I'm demonstrating Shindig for those who are new to it, let me bring up another person. In this case, it's a wonderful uh, former student of mine uh, at Georgetown University, Jordan Davis. Let me bring him up on stage. Hello, sir. Good to see you. Hey, Brian. Good to see you as well. And hello, Donna. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Hi, yeah. Jordan. Okay, great. Um, first and foremost, Donna, thank you so much for your work. As, as others have said in the chat so far, the work that you're doing is so important. And um, as the first black man in the history of my program, which is the learning design and technology program um, that Brian teaches in, I've been thinking about issues of inclusivity and justice uh, a lot uh, within education technology. And what I'm finding is that I actually did a research project for my learning analytics course last semester. And I found that a lot of learning analytics programs and education technology programs in general, like you said, are concentrated at these predominantly white private institutions. So like, what would it take in order to encourage more of these program startups? So having more learning analytics programs, more education technology programs at historically black colleges, um, you know, like Howard, like Hampton, like Morehouse, et cetera. Um, so that, like you're saying, more students who are going to these more um, racially diverse institutions have actual access to these programs. Uh, great question. Thank you. And congratulations on being the first. Um, I hope that you will not be the last and will recruit others. Um, I think one of the things that we always find, especially in these type programs, is that money and funding is um, essential and it's really the, the foundation of any type of program that we're trying to replicate. Um, with Breakthrough Tech, we have been fortunate to have um, some seed funding from a couple of funders who support our work. And so that is how we have been able to, we started in New York um, at CUNY, we expanded to Chicago at UIC, uh, then came DC at University of Maryland and George Mason. And then um, we recently announced um, expanding, and this is for our computing program at uh, FIU. So one of the things that we're hoping um, is that eventually we are creating a buzz. Um, we are also showing, um, we'll have the data to show that we are creating change um, within this area. And then we will have funders who will be able to support um, creating more programs like we're doing. We're hoping that uh, Breakthrough Tech will be a model that we could utilize and replicate in other institutions. And even in the cities where we're working, we're already thinking amongst ourselves internally to decide how do we engage more of the colleges and universities who are in these cities where we're currently working so oh. that we can um, be able to partner with, I'm in DC, so with Howard and um, with Bowie State and Morgan and any of the other universities that may not have access to this. So I think really it, it's funding and money, but as well, one of the things that is a, a key component of the work that we do is cross collaboration. So we do it, um, we're a nonprofit organization, Breakthrough Tech is a nonprofit organization, but we partner with higher ed. So it's important that we get buy-in from the university 
um, sector, but we also need industry engagement. So they can, industry can engage and provide funding, but we also need them to create opportunities and provide support for some of the programs that we're doing where, um, for example, our Sprinternships program, which is a micro internship program, being able to get more companies to host um, our students to go through that program, which provides them with that resume credential then um, that they can then take and hopefully get into other summer internship programs. So it's it takes funding, definitely, but it really takes, um, I hate to use the cliche of it takes a village, but it really does take a lot of different pieces um, to really combine and to work together to ensure that we're providing these opportunities. Yeah, thank you so much, Donna. Many follow-up questions and just other <laughs> thoughts, but I'm gonna hit you on LinkedIn. I got you. Okay, great. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks, Brian, appreciate it. Thank you, Jordan, thank you. Uh, again, so if you're new to the forum, that's an example of a video question. Pretty obviously. Uh, here, let me change the display a bit, make things a little, you know, a little more spread out, a little more comfortable. Um, thank you for that question, and Donna, it just you're describing what sounds like a, a, what will become a nationwide movement um, uh, if you if you keep doing this. Are are you going to keep focusing on public universities, uh, or are you going to expand to private ones as well? So I think for our computing side, so I, I want to make sure that I talk a little bit about the differences. I'm getting some feedback between our two programs. So we have our computing, which I'm a part of, and we focus on um, undergrads who are pursuing a computer science or an information sciences, um, which is a zip code 11 um, designation for all of our academics that may be on the call. We also expanded um, in on the AI side, and that AI mm. program is focused on access uh, differently. Um, and with that model, um, we are really, it was developed with industry leaders, um, and it's a really a free program that teaches students the skills to build AI solutions in real, real world conditions. So it's a combination of coaching and mentoring and internship, and then we hope uh, placement uh, to really launch their careers. Um, with that program, um, again, we started in New York, in the greater New York area, but we recently announced that we are expanding to Boston uh, at MIT and then LA, uh, UCLA. So, that is a, another um, component that we're introducing um, to the the list of activities that we have to be able to support students. Oh, very good. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to see that in Boston, too. Uh, friends, this is uh, your space for your questions to follow up. So please don't let me monopolize the mic. Uh, the, this is your environment. Um, and uh, we already have a question from Dean uh, Ron Friedman at uh, Purdue uh, Fort Wayne. Let me put that on the screen. What role do faculty play at the partner institutions? That's a great question. Um, faculty are essential to our work. Um, at each of our sites, um, we have a site lead um, as well. And the site lead is usually the program person who will manage uh, the work that's being done. But we also have a faculty lead. Um, and the faculty lead is really essential for helping to bridge the work that we're doing. Um, that person does a lot with helping faculty to understand the work that's happening, um, helping faculty to think about how they are delivering um, and teaching their classes, um, how they're recruiting students for research, um, what type of curriculum innovations may be involved in the work. Um, so one of the things that we want to make sure is that yes, in some instances, we have students who come in to college, they're accepted into the computer science program, they know exactly what they want to do. But we do have some students who may enter undecided or they may decide that they want to change majors. So we want to make sure that we are creating an environment that if it's someone who um, has, is undeclared or um, is in um, in the program, we want to make sure that the curriculum matches the students. And so uh, faculty is very important there. We also ensure that as part of the grant that um, money is built into the program to be able to support faculty in being able to um, 
engage in some of these innovations. So whether it's changing the curriculum, um, especially first and second year curriculum, um, introductory mm -hmm. curriculum, or it could be something where they have a, a summer research institute. We want to make sure that faculty is um, at the forefront of the work that we're doing because it's important not just to say we're doing this program, but that students are going to the program, they're declaring the major, and they have the support from the time that they declare a major to the time that they graduate. And faculty is assist, is essential to that. Well, that's that's a great great answer, uh, Ron. I, I, if you'd like to uh, uh, follow up, please uh, you know your raise click the raised hand uh, and join us on stage or, or type in another question. Um, that's a very very detailed uh, outline. Thank you for the question. And again, Don, that's a, a, a great answer. Um, and hello to Vanessa, who has just come in. And uh, in in the chat, uh, Donna, I don't know if you've if you've seen this. I'll share it afterwards. Uh, John Hallbeck shared a paper from 1990 uh, by the great Sherry Turkle and uh, Seymour Papert uh, about epistemological pluralism in computer science. And John pointed out this is a great article about women's voices and the problem remains. Um, so if you haven't had, I'll I'll copy the link again there so you can see it. Um, Thank you. And uh, we have uh, still more questions coming up. And Jordan has a great follow up. And Jordan, I think I'm just going to have to have you on stage for a while. Uh, Jordan <laughs> said, what is Breakthrough's pitch to potential donors? Do donors see this as philanthropic or do they see it as being a crucial and beneficial intervention for diversity in the field? We're hoping, um, I'm going to answer the last question first. Uh, we're hoping that they see it um, both ways. So we want um, industry to be engaged at all um, parts of this evolution. So we want them to support the work that we're doing and be able to provide the opportunities um, to be able to do the work. Um, and so at minimum, um, providing the infrastructure for us to be able to continue to, to run our organization. Uh, but the second piece is that we want industry to understand that as early in the process, the academic process, that they can engage with students, they can also use this to convert these students into their full-time hires. And so we want them to be able to see how beneficial an internship is to the students, first of all, um, and for the diversity of students who may not come from the traditional um, universities where uh, large companies tend to first recruit um, so they can see the potential of these students, that we have great students at all of our universities and they um, deserve to be showcased and this is a way for us to do it. But for the companies, we want them to see that this is their future. Um, these are their future hires. And so by supporting our program um, philanthropically, they are supporting the future um, because they are providing this program. They're supporting um, these amazing universities and institutions that are supporting the work that we're doing. But we're hoping that they will see um, the return on investment that they are able to then have these um, students once they graduate to then become their, their future workforce. And one of the things that I, I wanna mention about our spring internships, um, as I mentioned, it is a micro internship. So it's very, it's a very interesting um, uh, setup. It is three weeks that the students are working in these companies and the companies develop uh, a challenge project. And we don't want these students to just go in and say, oh, I'm pushing some paper around for three weeks. Or, you know, if it's something, um, it's grunt work, it, it's something that someone else doesn't want to do, that we have these students to do it. We want the companies to really think through a project that, one, um, may be um, essential to the work that they're doing, or it may be a project that they have not been, a been able to um, have their workforce to be able to prioritize and they may be able to have a set of students who can at least start some work, they can do the research, um, maybe provide some insight and then take that and be able to utilize it in the larger organization. Uh, again, we're hoping that they will provide, that the company will see it as a much larger return on investment, not just giving money um, to the 
the effort, but as well being able to contribute to a diverse workforce. And that's what we hope that they will see as really the biggest return on um, the support that they offer. Well, again, that's a, that's a very powerful nonprofit strategy. And Jordan, thank you for that great, great illuminating question. And Donna, what a, what a really rich answer. Um, I, I, of course, uh, inherently support you in, uh, in having this as a future investment, a uh, future forward investment. Thank you. Uh, we had a quick note uh, in the chat um, from uh, Donnie Sendelbach, uh, again, who says, um, I work at a small liberal arts college. Recent position searches have been disappointing in terms of diversity of applicants. I've been thinking lately about how it's upon us to provide mentoring to our own students to make IT more diverse for the future as a staff member. And there wasn't there wasn't a question there, but I, I wanted to share that comment. Um, uh, and Donna, did you want to you want to speak to that or, or uh, just let it stand? I, I will say I I agree wholeheartedly. Um, I think that it's important to think about um, how we're approaching it, and I hope that it's a conversation that's being had not just in higher ed but um, within curriculum. Um, so. How are you getting and retaining students? Um, and how does that then translate into the workforce? And so I'm hoping it's a, a, a comment and a desire that is not just resonating with a few people, but it's really resonating with as, everyone, whether it's industry, academia, or any other um, entity that may be hiring for the future. Thank you, Donnie, uh, for sharing that. Um, Donnie's an awesome person. Uh, and uh, Donna, thank you for the. It's gonna be hard to say Donnie and Donna, but I'll, I'll keep it. <laughs> uh, it's it's really good to uh, to hear that response. Uh, speaking of curriculum, we have uh, another question from uh, John Hollenbeck, uh, who wanted you to uh, develop one point. Interested more in curriculum matching the student. Computing and structural design are historically white male fields that do not account for other voices. Can it become pluralistic? So you know, how do you match the curriculum with the student, I guess is another way of putting it. So I can, my answer would be purely anecdotal because I am not coming from um, an academic background. However, I feel like it can. Um, I know that there are um, professors all across the country who um, are really focusing in on uh, DEI as a part of curriculum innovations. And so I think that it's important if there is uh, the desire and the mindset to be able to make um, curriculum more inclusive, then I think that it can be done. Um, I think that it is very important because we do see that um, some students, once they get into a program, um, be, just depend and the, the background can vary. Um, they may not have had the exposure to um, the curriculum or certain areas um, in their K-12 experience. Um, and so as a result of that, when they get to college, then it may be a culture shock and, and culture shock in terms of academia, academia and what they are seeing there. So I think it's important to, if we are, if we're all saying that it's important to um, have students engaged and to ensure that we are providing as much support in terms of the curriculum throughout a college career, then I think it's important for it to become pluralistic. And I think that it's important for those who have the, the will and um, most importantly, the opportunity um, to provide these innovations. I think, I know that they're, um, it, all academia is political. So it really depends on um, the faculty, whether there's a faculty senate and how things are agreed upon and how things are pushed through. Um, but I think that if we all make an effort um, to say that this is important, that it can change. Well, that's thank you that really goes really deeply into this question john thank you for the, for the clarifying question um we have more questions coming up and uh i want to welcome my friend from upstate new york uh ellen Yu, who is the uh, chief information officer at union college uh and she asks our institution is also focusing on women in computer science by focusing on hiring women faculty 
Does your program help universities to hire diverse faculty in the computer science departments? Great question um, and great work, Ellen. I support you wholeheartedly in, in what you're doing. Um, our program does not directly um, support the hiring of faculty. However, um, we are hoping that one of the things that each of the universities with whom we work um, develop a strategic plan on how they're going to achieve their goals in increasing the number of women that are graduating um, with these degrees. And so as a result of that, we recognize that there are some things that will um, that have been shown to support um, more women either entering um, the major, um, staying, meaning retaining them, and then graduating. Um, women faculty is an area that statistics show um, will help women um, who embark on that major to persevere. And so we want to make sure that we are offering support. Again, we do as part of our um, the funding, it can be used for faculty grants. So faculty grants is not going to fund um, a faculty position. However, it may support efforts by the faculty or by the dean um, to be able to do some things to um, maybe make it more attractive to um, come to this university um, to support the work, or they may be able to use some other funding um, to be able to support, again, summer research. So there are some small things that we do, but we don't directly um, work with recruiting diverse faculty. Well, so that's a, that's a great direct answer and also a, a really good uh, deepening of our understanding of how, of how your uh, uh, enterprise works. Um, thank you, Ellen, and, uh, and please say hi to my union friends there. We also have a follow-up question from Jordan. And Jordan, I, I'm, I'm going to just put you up on stage. In fact, I'm just going to do that now because you are so good, and I, I want to give you a chance to, to shine. Uh, so let me bring you up here. Um, Jordan has a question about curriculum development and about learning designers. And you can phrase that better than I can, Jordan. Why don't you cut loose? Oh, well, well, thank you, Brian. Um, I, I appreciate the time. And then, yeah, the, my, my question was mainly centered around how well, I wanted you to speak more about the curriculum development aspect of what the breakthrough does. Like, do you all have learning designers on your staff or like, do you, you know, ask individual like learning designers and like other places to come in and kind of hold? And then also are the learning designers mostly designing like the, the internships and the sprint internships and the high impact practices or do they also have a hand in developing like the the more formal like academic programs at these institutions thank you for the question so i think one of the things um the question was asked earlier about what is the role of faculty um in our work and that's where our faculty person comes into play our faculty lead um at each of the universities uh they really work um internally with um, their colleagues to really decide what type of innovations they want to have in the curriculum. And so it is developed in-house, um, which is, I think, the better way to do it, at least in the instances that I'm aware of um, as it relates to Breakthrough Tech. That is the best way so far that it has worked because um, the faculty that's there understands the students and understands um, the history of the work that has been done there, um, you understand general ed requirements, um, and then also understand how all of the different pieces of the curriculum play into creating um, the major and ensuring that students are getting the well-rounded um, education that they need to graduate. Um, so I think it is essential to be able to work within the confines of the university and be able to utilize the immense talent that is already there. Um, for example, we um, each, I spoke about the strategic plan that each university does. One of the things that they, they do is they look at their curriculum and find ways, especially in the introductory courses, in one, how to retain students. So if their students are already declared majors in that area, what are some ways um, that we can ensure that students are retained? They're looking at um, year over year data to determine, okay, this particular course may 
um, be a challenge for students in being able to to um, stay in that program? And so what innovations can we now incorporate to ensure that we are providing an opportunity for more students to um, persevere through the major? The other is how can we then make a course attractive um, to a student who may be a non-CS or IS major? So what introductory course can we now um, if it is possible, make a gen ed course so that they understand this is a computer science course. They can learn more about computer science and may pique an interest of a, a non-declared major um, to say, oh, maybe I'm now interested in computer science and information sciences. So it's important to really utilize um, the talent of your existing faculty to be able to um, create those innovations and figure out where there are opportunities to be able to grow it. So we, to answer your question, um, we look internally at the university to make those changes, but who knows what may happen down the line with external uh, developers. Got it. Yeah, that definitely answers my question. Yeah, thank you for that. Okay. Jordan, can, can I keep you on stage for a bit more? Sure. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I, well, I just know you're passionate about this, and you know a lot, and uh, and and I, I want to make sure that uh, um, uh, we get to pick your brain as much as we can too. Um, Donna, uh, thank you. Um, it's I'm I'm just struck by how complex your project is, uh, how many moving parts, and how many connections you have to make. That's that's a lot going on. Uh, friends, we're uh, we're coming close to the end, so this is the time to share your thoughts and questions. So again, hit the uh, raised hand button. Uh, if you want to join us on stage, uh, we can have up to six people here at a time, I think. So there's plenty of room uh, or fire off a question or answer. Uh, we did have uh, uh, a nice comment from Vanessa Vale, who says, as someone who was a female math major at a deep south university circa 1961, I can identify about support and attitudes, too. Um, and uh, Charles Finley and John Hollenbeck follow up by noting that faculty are not often learning designers and uh, the importance of personalized learning environments. Um, I, I had one question for you, Donna, while everybody else is thinking really hard. Um, I'm trying to imagine what would happen if breakthrough takes over the world, right? If, if, you, if, you, if you spread and spread and spread because there's so much interest and you're doing such good work, um, what would a college or university look like in say 10 years of all of this? Um, you know, what, what kind of impact would we see a, a, a truly multicultural, multi-ethnic, uh, multi-racial student body? Would we see the support staff have changed as well and also the faculty? I hope so. Um, you know, I, I hope that that is the goal. Um, I'm hoping that we will be able to see um, the trends in um, higher ed translate into the workforce as well. I think it's important to understand how we, we meaning Breakthrough Tech, see the synergy between industry and academia and the importance of one um, or, or both um, to the success of students. And so we don't not only want to see students to graduate and then get into the tech field, but we're hoping that they'll stay. Um, so we do recognize if we're looking 10 years down the line, we do recognize that um, there are some barriers now that exist where even if we, we think students are prepared and they graduate and they go into a tech company, um, for some diverse candidates, they may not stay for an extended period of time. So I think it's important to look at all of the, again, the supports that are happening um, while they're an undergrad, but as well into the workforce. And so I think it's important that um, if there is an effort um, to really diversify your department um, that includes not just the students, but as well the faculty um, and really making it an effort. Um, I want to, University of Maryland, for example, has the AREEB um, initiative and the AREEB Center, um, which really focuses on diversity and inclusion. Um, mm -hmm. and, in computer science and information sciences. And so I think that they have, um, there's one clear example of a university who has made it a priority um, throughout the work that they're doing. And they're supporting that with the various initiatives that they're doing and how they, they engage their student body and their faculty 
in the work that they're doing. I think other universities are doing it as well. It may not be on the same level um, as I foresee, but I think that um, we're hoping to see that diversity. And I'm a, an optimist at heart, so I'm hoping that this will translate into um, the work that we're able to do. And we definitely will see the numbers of women um, graduating, climbing, graduating with computer science. Let me always make sure that I'm yeah. clear. Um, computer science and information sciences degrees. Oh, thank you. That's a great vision. I, I, I love your optimism. Um, and I, again, I, that was a question from me. So let me get out of the way and get a couple of questions from other folks here. Um, this is one from uh, Purdue University Global, uh, Christina um, uh, uh, Setzkorn, who says, is DEI fully realized without a diverse administration? That is, even if we're able to hire a diverse IT, CSIS faculty, how meaningful are those initiatives with the homogeneous white male administration? The homogeneous white male administration. Yeah, I'll, I'll flash that back on the screen again because it's a long question. I think that uh, remains to be seen. I think that is one one part of the equation um, to be able to have the diverse administration. Um, we still see that there are challenges in being able to have that diversity in an administration. Um, so if that's one piece that has already been worked out, then I think that um, at least there is a will um, to have to diversify um, much deeper and hopefully working towards success. I think, again, it's about faculty and the numbers. Um, if you really look at across the board, um, the number of diverse faculty in this area in CS and, um, and CS specifically, but information sciences, you see a lot more diversity. But in computer science, um, it is a challenge to have to see the level of diversity. And I think it's a work in progress. Um, because things don't change overnight. I recognize that um, in the work that I do, but I think that if a, um, a university and an administration takes it on um, to be intentional about the work that they're doing, I think that they can create a strategy for getting there. Um, and hopefully they will get there within a reasonable amount of time um, by setting benchmarks and, and strategies and um, ways that they are going to engage with their full community. Yeah, and, and Brian, if you don't mind, I could just please, you know, please. say one thing about that too. Thank you for outlining that. And and I think too about the lack of diversity as far as like the, the CEOs and the business leaders in the technology space, specifically the education technology space. When you think about um, companies like Blackboard or Canvas or names mm -hmm. that are known within the education community, uh, most of them are, you know, white and, and Asian men. So how can we not only provide, you know, sprint internships for students to work on behalf of like an education technology company, but also entrepreneurial experiences in tech mm -hmm. to be like, hey, for three weeks, build your own education technology company, right? Like you go start the next thing, you know, the next shindig or the next Zoom or the next Canvas or whatever it may be. Like there is, you know, so many online educational offerings, like there is more than enough room for new, um, you know, technologies and innovations and tech companies to, to arise. And it will be great to see uh, more, you know, minority representation within the CEOs and the startups that we're seeing. In the, in the technology space. And, and Jordan, to that point, I, I wanted to mention one of our other um, um, infra, uh, standalone programs, which is our Guild program. Um, it's um, Sprint Internships is one, and then um, our Guild is our flagship. And Guild is more tailored to those students who um, are undeclared or undecided. Um, and we're hoping to potentially convert them to CS and IS majors. Um, and just to your point, during that, the Guild is a, a week-long program, and they have um, industry mentors who come in and support their work, but they're also learning um, usually some type of technical language, and they have a focus area. Um, our George Mason students um, did Guild about two, almost two weeks ago now, and their focus was around ed tech. And so the students learned uh, about the ed tech community and what that means. And over the course of the week, um, they were broken into teams and the teams had to develop some type of ed tech solution. 
um, and really the diversity of the um, ideas that the students came up with were just blow me away all, every time. Um, because with some of those things that they, some of the solutions they come up with, they could actually then be um, developed further into actual programs. There was one that was called, um, I think it was called Diverge. And it focused on, um, it was a task, um, a task project, task scheduling project um, for students who, um, neurodiverse students. Uh, neurodivergent students, I'm sorry. Um, and it, they set up an app, they built an app, um, they built this out in a week and they were able to show it and they showed all the bells and whistles. And then um, as part of their project, then they had to critique it and decide, okay, what additional supports do I need to put in place um, to be able to take bring this to market? And so those types of things, to your point, I think are, are quite important in another way that we're able to um, provide those opportunities to students um, that participate in Breakthrough Tech. Wow, yeah, that's amazing. Um, again, I wanna have like a separate conversation that dig even deeper into that, especially in the, the education technology one, but but that's so important. Um, I'm curious as to how how are students made aware of programs like, like Guild? Like what is the outreach effort like? Mm -hmm. So, of course, and I know, Brian, we're almost at time and I, I want to make sure that um, I'm um, sensitive to that. Um, but with the each of the programs, we tend to have a, um, a small cohort that we are recruiting from because it happens within that university. So um, at University of Maryland, their guild is in August. Their guild is in August for George Mason. They did theirs in um, early June and they send it out amongst their student body. Um, there are community colleges um, with whom they work and some of those students may be transferring in to George Mason or into University of Maryland and they share information there. As long as a student is affiliated with the university, then um, they can apply to the program uh, and then there's a criteria that the university will um, has developed. They are students are accepted into the program, and then they decide whether they want to participate. And Guild has a, a stipend for that week, um, a small stipend, um, but it does help to offset um, any minor costs that they may have for that week if they have to travel in or um, something like that. So it's usually within the confines of that university. Yeah, thank you for that. Oh, that sounds great. That sounds great. We, we have uh, one question that came in uh, that builds on a previous point, and I want to make sure we get to this uh, in our last few minutes together. This is from, uh, um, again, from Ellen Yu, who says, tagging onto Donnie's question earlier, have you thought about looking at IT departments in higher ed institutions as, quote, companies to work with? Um, so I think we do. Um, and is I'm not sure if this is regarding our sprint internship program or are you approaching it from um, a different idea? Ellen, are you able to provide some clarity? Yeah, um, and Ellen, if you, oh, I can beam you up on stage too if you'd like. Uh, let's see what she gets to give her a minute more. Uh, spring term, spring termship program. Okay. Yes, so we do um, utilize them for um, to host um, sprint internships, and um, we work within the universities. Um, each of the universities have um, different departments that also may support and host sprint terms. Um, so that's great. But yes, we do. To answer your question, yes, we do look at them as a company um, because they have real life um, projects that they want um, students to work on or have um, projects that someone should work on for a period and they may not have uh, the staff bandwidth to be able to support. So we do. Yes. Uh, Ellen, does, assume, does that help? Yeah, I would assume that would be local. So the kids that are at Maryland would be trying to find a local spring internship in the area, geographical area versus anywhere in the US. 
Well, mostly, however, um, because we are in this now virtual world, um, we have the yeah. opportunity to be able to provide virtual opportunities. And so um, we work, we have one company already that is signed on for our 2023 spring internship that is based in New Jersey. Um, and the sprint turns will be coming from the DC metro area um, and they will be doing that virtually. Um, and we are looking at some other companies who will be hosting virtual um, uh, sites for us in January of next year. So we're always uh, open to that as an opportunity. And especially for those students, we do have students who travel home um, during the summer, or I'm sorry, during the winter break when we usually do our spring internships and those virtual opportunities work. So we are open um, to host from really anywhere in the country, but anywhere that our students would then be able to um, reasonably be able to support. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Ellen. Good question. Good idea. I can imagine all kinds of possibilities coming from this. Um, so Ellen, let me uh, let you climb off the stage. Jordan, let me stop um, uh, hosting you on the stage all the time. Although, you know, again, bearded guys, you know, a special thing, right? Uh, special group. Um, and Donna, th this is this is terrific. I feel like we're in meeting you and learning about your work. It's like we're just wading into the first, you know, the first step of a giant wave of change. Um, how can how can people keep up with uh, what you're doing? How can people uh, follow and uh, and learn more? Definitely. Um, so we Breakthrough Tech DC is on um, many social channels, um, uh, Instagram as well as Twitter. Um, our sites, George Mason and um, the Breakthrough Tech programs at George Mason and University of Maryland have. Um, um, presence on social media, um, but I would encourage you all to follow our Breakthrough Tech um, LinkedIn site. Um, that has, they compile a lot of information across all of our sites, not just DC, but as our, on our computing side, as well as our AI side. So that is definitely a way um, to stay engaged. You can also visit our website, which is DC dot breakthrough tech dot org uh, again dc dot breakthrough tech dot org and you go there it has all of the links to our all of our social media handles so that um, it's easy you don't have to write anything down or remember if you just go to that site um, you can see a little bit more about what we what we do um, and learn a little bit more about our students and our sites at University of Maryland and George Mason on the on the bottom left of your screen, you all should see a kind of a mustard colored button that says Breakthrough Tech DC, and that should take you to the website directly. Um, oh, great. Um, I think people are going to be following you like mad as a result. We have <laughs> one question that came in. I, I don't want to miss this. This just snuck in. Uh, this is from a snuck in friend, and great uh, question from Finley, uh, who asks, at the very basic course level, how will rubrics and content in computer science and information sciences be different to be inclusive? That's a very direct, very practical, very material question. That's an interesting question. Um, and I'm not sure if I would be the most appropriate person to okay. answer that, uh, just because it varies by site. Um, it really varies by the curriculum of that particular university. And I think that my colleagues at University of Maryland and George Mason would be able to answer that more succinctly than I would be. I wonder, Donna, maybe not not next week, but, but down the road a bit, maybe we could uh, host you uh, in a panel session and bring on some of those faculty and some of those students. Oh, that would be great. Oh, I'd really like that. I'll, I'll follow up afterwards. Okay. Uh, and I have to say afterwards, because somehow it's three o'clock. Uh, somehow you have just taken us through a, a wonderful tour of, of the growing vistas of what you're doing with Breakthrough Tech DC. Um, thank you so much, Donna. I really just appreciate all, all the work you're doing and that you chose to take an hour to share with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brian. And thank you for everyone who joined us today and for the great questions. Oh, that's that's what we do. That's what we do here at the forum. We ask great questions.
But don't go away yet, friends. Let me just point out where we're headed next. Uh, if you'd like to keep talking about this topic, uh, about how to support women and underrepresented minorities in technology, um, on Twitter, just use the hashtag FTTE or just tweet at me, Brian Alexander at Shindig Events. Or if you'd like, hit up my blog at brianalexander.org. Uh, if you'd like to go into the past and look at our previous sessions about computer science, as well as about DEI, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. We have a whole bunch there. Uh, looking ahead to still more issues, again, at Forum, the Future of Education at US, you can see the topics that we're looking at, everything from public higher ed to free speech and the Paradigm Project. And if you want to share any of your work, including your work with DEI, shoot me a note. I'd be delighted to share it with the whole community in the world. And let me then just close by echoing what our wonderful guest just said. Thank you all for your questions and thoughts. Uh, it's just been wonderful hearing from you. It's been great to further advance this cause. And thank you all for thinking together with all of us. I hope you're all safe. I hope you're all cool where you need to be cool and warm where you need to be warm and dry when you need to be dry. Um, above all, take care, be safe, and we'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.